2014, thank God, was a blessed year. We all made it. God was with us. He watched over us. He provided for us. He helped us in more ways than we'll ever know. He brought us to this hour, and he brought us to this place, this new church, Holy Transfiguration Church, a church with a mission. I thought a lot about this last year, 2014, and I began to ask myself, like I always do, was it very different than the year before? Did I lose weight and gain health? Did I lose ear hair and gain wisdom? Did I lose my keys less often than the year before? Like really life-changing stuff. Did I accomplish any goals? Or did I do the same ordinary stuff that I did the year before and the year before that? Was it another okay year? One that came and went like all the rest. I remember saying at this time last year, I can't keep tolerating okay years. I have one less year left. As I get older, that hits me more and more every year. I have one less year left. I won't get to say that forever. There will be a time when I will say it for the last time. When I look at this year, 2014, in some ways it was very different. Part of it, I will be honest, had to do with resolutions that we made last year at St. John Church. Uh, some of us were there at St. John Church last year, and you may remember how we took a challenge. It was a challenge of resolutions. Six resolutions, six challenges we took last year. And for the first time at the end of the year, I remember almost all of them. I mean, there were six, and I couldn't remember that sixth one for the longest time. You could see how committed I was to that last one. But remembering is a good start. And I realized I accomplished about four and three quarters of them, which actually to me was pretty good. I spoke to some other people that took the challenge. One of the challenges was to read the whole Bible in a year. Several people did that and said that was the first time I'd ever done that. Someone said, I tried and I didn't finish it, but I've never read more than I did this year. So, as I spoke to more and more people, it seemed like progress was made, and it was for the good. And I thought, maybe we were on to something here. Maybe, for the first time in my life, resolution stuck with me, and I became a better person. And I thought, what if we could replicate that same thing again? What if we had that same method changing our lives better every year, every day? Before I talk about the resolutions themselves, there were some things I wanted to look at that I feel really helped accomplish, helped me to accomplish those resolutions. Number one, I cannot underestimate the benefit of doing the same resolutions that many of you signed up to do. And we did them together. Usually when I make my resolutions at the beginning of a year, I grab a random piece of paper, sometimes a napkin or a Kleenex, I jot a few notes, I get excited, I give it a really good try, and then I fail, and then I stop, my life goes back to the way it was. No one seems to know and no one seems to care that I stopped because no one else was involved. But last year, what I saw was that we were working on the same goals. We were running in the same direction, and I was encouraged to be part of something bigger. And what I felt like what that gave me was accountability. When someone asked me at several months in, how's it going? And then at 11 months, I was reminded by someone, we're almost there. And it woke me up, the fact that we were doing something together. And one of the resolutions took pretty much a whole year, reading the whole Bible. Now here we are today, 
at this church. We came a long way this last year at this brand new church. I'm so encouraged by everyone's enthusiasm and their willingness to share and foster this energy together. All my life, I've wanted to be big, a part of something that's bigger than myself. I want to be part of a movement. I've always wanted to be part of a church where we all move forward together. And believe it or not, we're small enough to do it. I mean, it's not that hard. We could all potentially do this together. This year, all of our lives could be different if we set our goals and commit to them together. This year, I'm not an army of one. We are an army of many. And we're one army. By looking at you, I feel stronger already. I feel like I'm getting prettier already. I'm already getting younger by being a part of this army. Do you remember that one of the biggest goals of this church is for us to develop the sense of community. And when we did our series on community, we said one of the most important parts of a community is that that group works together for a common goal. That helps to define a community. This is our chance for us to all grow together. And if we have a plan well, sorry, we do have a plan that we're going to try and implement as a church in about three weeks. In the beginning of Lent, we're going to do what we call community groups. Community groups are kind of like life groups or small groups. Uh, we've had some success, with it, some success with this in the past, but we want to have more. I spoke with the fathers, the priests, and this is something that we really want to try this year. We're in the process of breaking down the church by geography, by regions. Hopefully, we're going to have five or six host couples that will hopefully host four or five couples each. The groups are going to get together maybe once a week during every week of Lent, not at the church, but in your homes, in a nice, comfortable, convenient atmosphere where we're going to try and live life together. We're going to encourage each other, inspire each other, lift each other up, and pray for each other. We're going to move forward together. But more of those details we're going to talk about in the next few weeks. Being a part of a community, I think doing these goals together really helped me in my own resolutions. The second thing was constant reminders. And this worked for six months last year. And I say that because for six months we were doing it together at St. John Church and then we started this church and not everyone was doing it and we stopped announcing it here. But for the time we were at St. John Church, we were almost every month saying, this is where we should be. You should have read at the end of 30 days, 90 chapters. At the end of 60 days, you should have read. So we were moving together. We were constantly being reminded, constantly being pushed. It was because we were all attending the adult meeting. And that's the responsibility of this meeting. If we're going to try and set goals, if we're going to try and move together, it's our responsibility to try and move you step by step. We can't do that unless you're here. We would like, as often as you can, if you're not teaching Sunday school, if you don't have some other urgent obligation, we want you to be a part of this meeting. We're doing our best to record them, put them online. You're going to be getting them in the email. So even if you miss one, I want you to know the direction the church is going. I want you to plug in to this meeting. You'll get your reminders and we'll do this together. Now I'm going to talk about the resolutions themselves. I believe in well-balanced resolutions. We're multifaceted, multidimensional people, and for us to grow, we need to pay attention to different aspects of our lives. So I thought this year I'm going to do an online search for well-balanced resolutions. Like, what would these look like? And this is what I found. Family-oriented resolutions. I resolved to work with neglected children. My own. I thought that was a good one. I found one that was commitment-oriented. 
Someone wrote, I resolved to find out why the corresponding course on mail fraud that I purchased never showed up. Someone's got determination. There's some financial resolutions. We always come up with some. Some of us plan to buy lottery tickets at a luckier store. And some of us will stop buying useless things like the DVD rewinder that you bought for Christmas. It's always good to have a few safety resolutions. Resolve to keep an extra safe distance when driving behind police cars. And I'll even drive closer to the speed limit this year. And of course, health resolutions. I really liked these, that I will not eat medicine just because it looks like candy. And my favorite, I will never take a sleeping pill and a laxative in the same evening. For those of you who are slowly grasping that. Um, and then intellectual growth. And I thought this one really struck me. I want to find out what the word resolution means. Every year we come up with them and we seem not to really understand what a resolution is. Now, I'll be honest. Um, I passed these along to the priests. They backed some of them, but not all of them. Um, and so we had to do a little bit of, a little bit of searching here. And so I began to think about resolutions I've made in the past. At this time of year, I always try to direct my life towards my dreams and my desires. I always come up with my own purpose, how blind I was. The life that I'm living this next year, I actually got it from God. It was given to me by God. It was designed by God, initiated by God, planned by God, and sustained by God, and meant for God's purpose, not mine. God's purposes are supposed to consume my life. They're supposed to direct my every value, every decision. It's supposed to be the one thing I can't live without. It's supposed to add adventure to my routine to spice the mundane. It's supposed to break me, build me, challenge me, and change me to be what God wants me to be, not what I want to be. It's supposed to take my broken dreams and give me God's, exchange my weaknesses for His strengths, my failures with His triumphs. I'm supposed to live a life full of meaning and purpose beyond what I can see and according to what God has planned. There's this quote that I want to share with you. The meaning, purpose, and significance of our lives are found only by aligning our lives with God's purposes and lives committed to following Christ. Every year, the purpose of our resolution is so that somehow our lives are made better. And yet by this quote, the purpose and the meaning and the significance of our lives are only going to be found in one place when they're aligned with God's purposes and a commitment to follow Christ. So I began to think, what is God's purpose for us here at Holy Transfiguration Church? What's our purpose? What's our mission? Now I went over this before when we first started this church. What is the mission of Holy Transfiguration Church? It's clearly no one knows. Transformation. The mission of the Holy Transfiguration Church is transformation. And that is an awesome word. And most of us have no idea what it means. But that's our goal. So what does it mean? What do we want to be totally transformed into? into well I think I discovered the ultimate resolution this is the one New Year's resolution that we should always aim for and actually it's going to be the resolution of this church it's actually one of our core values and it comes from this verse and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are the called according to his purpose for whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. God the Father's plan was for us to be the image of his Son. 
And it says, those whom he predestined, these he called, whom he called, he justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Again, the meaning and the significance of our lives are emboldened, empowered, and lifted when they are aligned with this. So I'm going to sum it up in this. The Father's purpose is for us to be the image of his Son by the grace and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That's our purpose. That's our mission. That's our transformation. Transformation. And so I feel like this verse really sums it up. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 to 18. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Meaning our eyes are opened. The Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, the image of Christ, from glory to glory, as by the spirit of the Lord. This is the ultimate resolution, and it's one of the core values of this church. This is what we believe in. If you go back and look at the core values in that pamphlet outside, the goal of this church is not for you to come to the liturgy and drink coffee and leave. The goal of this church is not for us to decide to just be good Christians or to just be better people that this year we'll try not to kill anyone or rob banks, and yeah, and maybe we'll go to the liturgy and sometimes we'll fast. Probably a lot of times we'll fast, but that cannot be our decision. That is not what we're aiming for. This verse says, when we come to Christ, when one turns to the Lord, the goal is to be transformed to the same image from glory to glory. So now... I want you to understand that we started this church not to just be like another church where you happen to go on Saturday mornings. You know, that wasn't your plan either. Eventually we'll move to Sundays. But the purpose of this church is for us to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ himself. This would be the most amazing church on the planet if we accomplish this. It's what God wants. And this is not easy. It's going to require a lot of hard work. We're going to do a series at the beginning of Lent and our small groups are going to be based on this. We're going to go into this a lot deeper. But ultimately we want to be like Christ in his character. We want to have the mind of Christ like St. Paul tells us. We want to have the heart of Christ like he describes. We want to in some ways even have the flesh of Christ as he bore a cross in his crucified broken body and especially the actions of Christ. That's the goal of our Christianity. That's the goal of this church. So what I want to do is challenge us here this year at Holy Transfiguration Church. Now those of you who know me know that I get a little crazy when it comes to challenges. I'm not trying to turn anyone off. I'm trying to make the challenge a challenge. So those of you who have received the papers, uh, these are the 10 challenges of Holy Transfiguration Church for individuals. I'm not asking you to sign this and date it and give it to me today. And there's 10 of them. You can initial whichever one you want to commit to. But if our goal is going to be like Christ, you will be the most amazing person that everyone around you knows if you become like this. This is the ultimate resolution. Then we have to start making steps. So these are the challenges of Holy Transfiguration Church for 2015. Number one, in order for us to know what Christ is like, we should read his story daily in the New Testament. So, this year, instead of reading the whole Bible, we're going to focus on reading about Christ. The New Testament is 260 chapters. 
I realize I let 23 days go by, but you have 341 days to finish 260 chapters. I'm giving a few extra catch-up days, like 80 of them. Why we can't finish 260 chapters in this year means we're really not trying to be like Christ. I mean, I want you to know that, you know, a lot of the fathers and the saints and in my confession, Father said, Mark, I need you to read the Gospels every day. He says, read whatever you want in the Bible, but I need you to read a chapter of the Gospels every day. Some of the fathers would read all the Gospels every week. Some would read all the epistles of Paul every week. I mean, they want you to be immersed in the story of Christ because you'll never be like him unless you know what he's like. I think this one could be the most doable. Right? 260 chapters, you can break some of the longer chapters into two days, almost three days. Then the next thing I want you to do, number two, I want you to do a personal Bible study on a certain part of the New Testament every month. And you're like, well, what does that mean? I'm reading it every day. I'm going to differentiate. What I want you to do is read a chapter every day, whether or not you want to, whether or not you benefit from it, whether or not you like it. I want you to get in the habit of reading about Christ every day. It could take three minutes but I want you to be attached to reading about him every day. But then I really want you to study maybe once a week, twice a month. So next week, I would like you to bring Bibles. We're going to learn how to do our own personal Bible study. I'm going to give you the worksheets so that you can take them home and you can implement this on your own. It's really simple. It's four questions. Everyone can do this. So you have 260 chapters, 341 days, maybe two days a month. You go back and read the same chapter and you do the Bible study on it. We're going to grow and we're going to learn to love not only the Bible, but we're going to love Christ so much more. Number three is commit to a spiritual rule. Spiritual rule is almost like your daily spiritual regimen that your spiritual guide gives you. And it will have to be given to you by your spiritual father. I can't say we're all going to do everything the same every day. We're all at different levels. But this would include a combination of prayers, a combination of Bible reading, a combination of matanyas, maybe amount of tithing, whatever it is. But it's something that you should do daily. Because if you never spend time with him, you'll never become like him. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians where it says, We are the fragrance of Christ. We are the aroma of life to those who believe. And I thought, how does someone become the fragrance of someone else? I used to work with this physician that when he walked into the room, man, he had the strongest cologne ever. Like you knew when he was there, his presence was known by his fragrance. And the longer you spent with him, the longer you began to smell like him. Now I never ventured to hug him or sit on his lap. We never got that close. But I imagine the closer I got to him, the more I would be the same fragrance. It's the same thing with Christ. The more I spend time with Him, the more enmeshed I am with Him, the more I just sit in His lap and embrace Him, the more I will begin to smell with the fragrance of Christ. You will not grow or be like Christ if you do not have a spiritual rule. My father in confession sent me one several weeks ago, and it's been the best thing that's happened to me in years. Number four, there's this thing that we do in the church. It's called living the life of Christ. Do you know that the whole year, we celebrate every 
aspect of Christ's life from the time he was announced that he was born, from when he was born, from when he circumcised, from when he went to the temple, when he was baptized, he was transfigured, when he went to Egypt, when he was crucified, buried, resurrected, rose, transfigured, everything. Everything. My brother uh, serves with a priest whose brother is a bishop. And this bishop is an amazing, amazing bishop. And so my brother, he's visiting in America right now. My brother's like, oh, can I get you books or whatever, you know, like, you know, that you might not have in Egypt? He's like, you know what? He's like, to be honest, I'm, I'm really not one of those academic people that reads a lot. Um, what really makes a difference to me is when I live the life of the church. And he says, Pope Carolos gave this sermon Pope Carolos, you know, like the miracle worker, the holy man of God. And he says, the most important thing for me is for me to live the life of Christ in the church. You know what that means? That we celebrate his feasts. Now, I realize we can't make it to all of them. But what if this year we decided, you know what, I'm going to maybe fast with the church more. I'm going to try to come to maybe two more feasts that I don't usually attend. Maybe you don't come to Christmas and Easter and you say, maybe this year I'm going to try my best. I'm going to come to Easter. I'm going to come to Palm Sunday or Holy Week. You don't have to come to all of them. But the more you get involved in celebrating Him, the more you're going to be living His life. Those four are kind of like getting to know Christ the next six are more kind of getting to act like Christ. So these get a little bit dicey as well. Number five is, I will carry the cross with someone this year. Simon of Cyrene, as Christ is carrying the cross, falling under the weight of the cross, they call someone in the crowd, you come and carry the cross with this Jesus person. And so he takes this heavy cross and he lifts the burden of Christ for even such a short while. Father Beshoi Camel has this like great prayer or meditation. He says, Dear God, allow me to be like Simon of the Cyrene. Let me be a cross bearer for you. And how do we become a cross bearer for him? When we find someone else to carry their cross with. Now this one is tough. This one is not fun and that's why they call it a cross. This one may exhaust you. But I think everybody knows someone who's carrying some burden. It could be an illness. It could be incredible trauma or grief. And you might have to deal with someone who might be depressed or sad or lonely or just needs some help, some push, someone to just not take the cross away from them, but help make their cross a little lighter. I promise it'll be the best church if we all become community cross bearers. You have 12 months to find someone around you that's suffering. I think it shouldn't be hard. You shouldn't have to look too far. And you might find that some of the services in this church, you'll be able to do that. Number six, I'm going to restore a relationship or build a relationship with someone. Many of us have a relationship in our lives that is not pleasing to God. That we've cut someone off, someone that we don't want to love. Ultimately, Christ, his heart was expanded. Actually, his heart was infinite. That he embraced everybody. The thief, the prostitute, the tax collectors, the lepers, everybody. His heart expanded so much. 
What if our hearts expand for maybe one more person? Now, I realize this one might be hard, and you may not be able to restore that relationship this year. Maybe there's a new relationship you can build. One new one. For the sake of being like Christ. It might be someone that you haven't had a bad relationship with before, but you know that you should begin to have a relationship because it might be God's pushing you to do so. Number seven, I will financially relieve the burden of someone this year. Now this is different than you see a homeless person, you give them a dollar. I was just in Egypt recently, and I saw how a hundred bucks could change people's lives. A hundred bucks. I mean, that's like almost 800 pounds in Egypt. I mean, when people are living on a few pounds a day, that's a lot. We could do this as a church, where as a church, we financially relieve the burden of maybe some village in Egypt or in Africa or India or South America. We talked about this in the Generous Giving series. But even if we don't do it as a church... Maybe there's somebody in your community, in your family, maybe in your small group. My brother was telling me at his church, they started these community groups. There was a group of like five or six families. And one of those families, uh, the husband and wife both were unemployed. It just happened that they were both unemployed. The other four or five families said, you know what, together we are going to carry you. Now, I'm not saying the other four or five families were rich. It hurt them. It was a painful contribution. But could you imagine the family that received that from those around them? Everyone worries about being able to provide for their family. And what about when you tried everything and you can't? And someone else does. You could touch a life forever. God willing, we'll find an opportunity. Number eight is like I gave last year. I want us to serve Christ for seven days this year. Now, if you do Sunday school, that's great, but that's not seven days. What I'm asking about are seven full, exhausting days. It might be a project that we do, a Habitat for Humanity. It might be a house-building trip in Mexico. It might be something that we decide to do in our community. But I would like for you, for seven days, whether it be on Thanksgiving where we go feed the homeless or on Christmas, whatever it is, I want you to think, could you serve God for seven days, which is one week, which is about 2% of the year. 2% of the year I'm asking for us to give God number nine to be like Christ I have to be an active member of his body and so we're we're trying to get organized but that means every single person does something in this church everybody if you are the coffee passer outer or the communion cup thrower awayer Whatever it is, it's your service. You will do something. And you will be an active member of, not this church, of the body of Christ. We talked about what it meant to be a member of his body. That's one of our core values. Every member doing their part. And number 10. We call this a mission church. And the mission is to share Christ with others. Now, this is going to be hard. A lot of us are not comfortable with talking to someone else who's not Christian about Christ. Or maybe a Christian who is a Christian but isn't really very Christian, talking to them about our church. We're going to go over, we'll do a series this year on how we can train you and prepare you to do this. But that's something I would like. Could you imagine if the 50 of us all brought 50 people? this church would burst out of its seams. So, you have the challenge before you. It'll be posted on our website. I only made uh, 25 copies. 
Um, for those of you that are, you know, a couple and want to print it and copy it, and so that way we can try and share together. Listen, this is not a church where we just come to a liturgy and leave. The goal of not this church, but the goal of God's plan is for us to become like Christ. Will you walk on this journey as a community together. Go home, pray about it, ask for God's grace. Mark the ones you want to mark, sign it. You don't have to give it to me. But put it somewhere so that in a year, we're going to go back and look and see what was your experience like when you got to carry someone else's cross? You relieved someone else's burden or you loved his story in the Bible and now you can't put it down. Come back next week. Be a part of this group and let's grow together. God be with you.